Good afternoon. For all of us, open source is a journey, particularly literally today because we traveled from all over Romania and from all over Europe to be here in Bucharest. Like um, Sashiko and James before me, I'd like to make, uh, I would like to thank the European Commission and the, Europe and the uh, Romanian presidency for making this possible and inviting us over here today. All of us here, you might not have noticed, but this conference is also a journey. It's taking us through the progress, through program in, in planned steps. This morning we heard from global institutions and big public services about how they are using open source, how they are trying to make their source codes available, their applications shareable, <clears throat> and how to fit them in their architectures. We saw concrete examples of sharing and reuse. We heard from coders and from researchers about short and long-term impacts of open source on public services and how to take care of communities, both in terms of code, but also in terms of the humans, the human beings. Because communities, that's the thing with open source. As they say on the internet, if you want to go fast, you do it alone. And if you want to go far, you do it with others. And that meme is very appropriate because in this third session, we aim to give you a few awesome examples of how open source can help public services get close to a very important community, citizens. Like the speakers in the earlier sessions, sharing is about collaboration. Collaboration means attracting outsiders and attracting outsiders is trying to find out how do I reach these open source communities. We have four speakers who know all about this, so allow me to introduce the first, Paco. Give me a second, I need to click on things. Paco was the first Director General of Informatics at the European Commission. He was also one of the first advocates of open source at the European Commission, and he took the commission on the path that brings us here today. So, thank you for that. Officially, he's retired, but he can't get enough. So, he's still here advising the commission on e-government things, on digital transformation for free. And Francisco, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Agesta. And uh, good afternoon to everybody. So, my first challenge is uh, to keep you away after this uh, copious uh, lunch we uh, that has been offered, <laughs> offered by the organization. And uh, what I wanted to do is uh, to share with you what I lived when I was um, in the United States uh, for one academic year and uh, the journey. There will be a number of slides. I'm going to go fast on some of them because uh, you can read the content uh, later. And I want to reach uh, the last slides uh, with the lessons uh, that uh, I learned. But I was uh, both uh, a technical uh, uh, um, co-creation and a human experience of working with those guys uh, who are devoted to community work uh, in some of the even poor communities uh, in, um, in the States. So uh, the story started uh, after I was appointed, uh, I left my job as a director general and I was appointed uh, chief IT advisor of the, the commission. And I was looking for uh, an interesting project uh, for the future apart from the, the typical advisor kind of uh, and consult consultancy kind of uh, work that uh, was uh, allocated to my portfolio. And uh, it came across uh, um, a document called uh, A Vision for Pu Public Services uh, that was uh, published in uh, June 2013 uh, by uh, DigiConnect. And in reading the document that was uh, uh, written by the colleagues uh, in the e-government unit, I found uh, an inspiration for something I wanted to do um, in, in the future. I'm not going to tell you to read the details. Uh, you have uh, there the link uh, to, to the document. If not, uh, if you search on, on Google, you are going to find it. And it's a very interesting one because it's the basis uh, for some of the principles have been applied to the government strategies uh, since uh, then. So one of the things uh, that the document is uh, promoting is something that you have seen in many presentations about EGOV uh, that is being delivered by the, the uh, people in the, in the uh, European Commission. It's about uh, an open governance framework that is the basis uh, for collaboration and it's about transparency, participation and, and collaboration. 
And uh, transparency is an obli obligation. Collaboration is uh, what we should be doing and we, don't, we are not doing enough. And uh, participation is the real ta challenge. How to make uh, people participate uh, in the task of the government so that is not only what the government can do for you, but uh, what can you do for the government as well. So um, I have been working for many years on delivering e-government services. I have spent all my professional life in public administration, and I was on one side of the fence, the supply side. And I said to myself that I wanted to go on the other side of the fence, the receiving, the customer, uh, the customer side. And that's why I started with uh, this project. And in order to do it, um, I had to reflect on how the government is perceived by many citizens, particularly youngsters and the millennials. Government is a vending machine. The only thing you can do is uh, you can kick the machine in the face of the, probably the official that is uh, on, uh, there on the desk uh, waiting for your complaint and probably is not guilty about that. And every four years, uh, sometimes uh, we are consult consulted about uh, who do you want uh, to manage uh, your files uh, in, uh, in the future? What, what is the, the government? The second thing, in, in many cases, particularly where there, is, uh, there are not enough means, Digital service is uh, like uh, feeding a uh, baby. This is uh, the food you are going to have today. And open the mouth, you get it. So with this uh, reflection in mind, I said to myself that uh, I needed uh, to open up my mind to change completely the environment and to go somewhere where uh, technology is pervasive and see what is the future of, uh, of uh, digital services. And then I applied uh, for a fellowship uh, with the European Commission, and I passed. Uh, so I presented my, I, I submitted my project, and was uh, finally approved. And then on the 20th of August 2014, I was uh, at the University of Berkeley. So I was working with uh, CITRIS, uh, particularly that is uh, the Center for Information Technology Research in the Interest of Society, with uh, the School of Information and uh, with the Institute for European uh, Studies. It was uh, the experience of uh, my life. And then I came across, uh, through my office mate, uh, uh, across a Code for America. So uh, I found a network of uh, people who wanted to contribute uh, to deliver better digital services in, in government. And I met them in San Francisco, was uh, close to Market Street, and uh, to Mission Street, <laughs> and I spoke uh, to them. And what uh, they did uh, was very nice uh, for me, fully fit uh, in, uh, into what, uh, what I wanted. And, um, Based on that, uh, they, they gave me the, the principles, and you can find that on their website. Uh, so the last one is the most important one, is uh, be a platform for civil engagement and participation. So <laughs> this is the challenge. And uh, make the government learn from what the, the citizens uh, can contribute to. So those guys uh, have a, a number of activities, and uh, the most important ones are the, those three. It's a brigade net network that is close uh, to the cities and is uh, linked uh, to the, the work that they organize around the city. Fellowships uh, that they do with public administration and they pay the fellows. And then uh, they are uh, looking for talent uh, to be deployed uh, around public administration. So they have uh, today 76, uh, by the way, I think they have uh, their, um, their uh, uh, conference uh, very soon uh, now in, in June and it's uh, really great, uh, I, I attended one. And uh, I, I decided to go um, and get involved with the brigades. And I did uh, particularly with Auckland. That was uh, the first uh, brigade that was uh, uh, formed. And I was uh, probably the most uh, mature one. Then I was also with San Francisco, but they were starting at the time. So how do I get uh, uh, got uh, in touch with them? Very simple. You go to Meetup, you apply, and then you are there. You, you go there, you are offered pizza or uh, Chinese, and then uh, you speak to everybody. And, uh, you start uh, introducing yourself, and then uh, you go and participate. And uh, I met all those uh, guys that are there. And I had interviews uh, with some of them to, to see why they were involved in this uh, kind of activities, uh, particularly the two captains uh, were Eddie, who was also a fellow, and uh, Spike, who was uh, very pushy about uh, open data, but also with uh, Ronald, with Ellie, and with uh, Neil. All of them have a background, had a background on community work, and that was uh, the inspiration for them to participate on that, and they were interested in digital. There were many teams working on different projects. When I was there, there were three activities I, I particularly appreciated. Open budget, that were discussing the budget into the city hall, and, uh, and uh, it's around, it was around 20,000 lines of Excel. 
So those guys said, how the citizen is going to give their view on this kind of, a, of, a, of, a, of a document. So they decided to create an application, and you have a, it's a there in, uh, in uh, GitHub, uh, in order to make the, the, uh, the budget uh, readable for everybody. And uh, they open up uh, channels uh, for people to participate into the discussion for uh, the next uh, two-year budget. The second thing was uh, open discussion that was uh, with the ethics uh, commission. And one of the officials of the ethics commission was uh, one of the leaders uh, of the project and was uh, in order to disclose uh, the funding that uh, all the uh, members of the council would have received in order to become uh, members. And that was a uh, very important in terms of uh, transparency. The, the, the lady then went to, to work uh, for another uh, community in the north of, of, of the United States. And the final one uh, was uh, this uh, civil testing group uh, is uh, this uh, issue of uh, what I referred to before, that was uh, what kind of application are we providing to the, to the citizens. Uh, so uh, Oakland has uh, two parts, a rich part on the mountain and a poor part on the downtown and close uh, to the water, to the waterfront. And uh, one of the means uh, for to make people participate uh, was, uh, is uh, stopping or what? <laughs> Uh, okay, good. <laughs> Great. Uh, in any case, I will get, I will get there on time. Uh, so, what uh, they were collecting, basically millennials, uh, that were very uh, well uh, uh, used to use uh, their, their telephone, so that uh, they were testing the applications uh, that uh, they were developing. And in exchange, they were giving them, of course, a visa and a number of vouchers uh, to be spent on sodas uh, around the around around the city. And was really great because uh, some of the feedback were wonderful. They said, you are going to put that into production? I wouldn't use uh, this uh, uh, bullshit software in my life. So that was a, a very good uh, kind of, a, of a participative uh, uh, kind of, a, of a activity. And with uh, youngsters, uh, millennials are going to be the ones that are going to run this world in the next uh, 10 years. And the worst thing that can happen is uh, perhaps uh, some of the citizens today can hate the government. They are going to ignore the government if uh, we don't change. So one of the things that impressed me more uh, most uh, on, uh, on this uh, brigade compared to others uh, was the maturity in running the, the project. And I attended a couple of sessions uh, where people were trying to train the, the different participants in how to create uh, um, uh, traction on the project so that uh, you deliver seriously as if uh, we are professional. The teams are where multidimensional if you want. So different kind of expertise. Uh, I met there uh, MBA students uh, from the University of Berkeley who wanted to get uh, some hands uh, in technology. I, I had there people who were already uh, very, um, highly qualified professionals uh, for, um, for, for IT. And, uh, and uh, the teams uh, were working uh, wonderful. And, and I think that uh, the way they have defined uh, their process uh, for uh, participation and uh, for delivery was uh, really something that was uh, unique and has been copied uh, by, 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 other, uh, by other communities and other brigades. By the way, the issue on the ethics uh, has been used uh, apparently in many other uh, cities uh, around uh, California. So there is a sharing and reuse as well from the brigades and, and Code for America is there in order to facilitate it. So I had an interview on one side uh, with the official IT part because uh, I went to San Francisco and the guy said to me, I don't believe in this issue of co-creation and what uh, these kind of brigades uh, are, produce, uh, are producing is bullshit. And then I went to the guy in Oakland and I said, listen, with my current resources, I have enough uh, to keep the light on, <laughs> I don't have money. The second, uh, I like working with them, so they are nice. Uh, I try to, to provide a, as many data sets uh, as I can. Sometimes uh, I had to dig into the different legal system and uh, they will do things uh, I cannot do with uh, my current skills and uh, resources, so they are welcome. On the other side, uh, I interviewed the, ca the captain of the brigades. I said, uh, what do you ask uh, the city hall to do for you? I said, appoint a chief data officer. Uh, we want data. We need data, and we take care of the rest, so we can help uh, with that. We have the ear of the mayor, and that is fundamental for our work. That is uh, essential, because with that, uh, we are heard. And then uh, we work better if the officials are supporting with us. Example, the ethics uh, project. We have different profiles and uh, we accept everybody. And uh, we also want to help participants uh, to learn. So it's a learning kind of a process and that is important for us as well. So I will repeat uh, what uh, Gays uh, said. Uh, 
this is a journey, and uh, if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go uh, far, go together. And then, yes, things are changing everywhere. Either we adapt or they are, not to, they are going to ignore us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Paso. It's not every day that you will hear um, a director general advocate ways to kick the machine. And he was right on time, even though the, the counter got stuck. So he had actually a minute extra. Our second speaker, um, Despina Mitropoulou, um, leads the Greek op Sorry. Not in my book. Anyway, you can be the, Despina, you're the second speaker. She leads the Greek open source uh, advocacy group already for a decade. Um, it started when she was studying media um, and technology, and she got interested, uh oh, sorry. I'm sorry, guys, I have them mixed up. Bastian. Bastian, I think you should take the stage. That's fine, I'll switch. Bastian studied philosophy. And one day in the year 2000, <laughs> one day in the year 2000, he opened Amux, which I know very well, and he never looked back. He's actually a serious software developer since right about that time. And right now he's working as a free uh, software officer for the French uh, public administration. Bastien, over to you. Hi, everyone. Uh, Thank you very much. It's uh, both an honor and a, a pleasure to be here. Uh, thanks for the organization. Uh, <clears throat> I am not the French digital minister, uh, but you can think of me as the French free software minister. Um, I learned about free software 20 years ago by reading a paper by Richard Stallman, and he has this very uh, simple and straightforward definition for free software being freedom, equality, uh, fraternity. So Richard Stoneman kind of played the role, uh, James mentioned his mother, and you can think of Richard Stoneman as playing this moral role uh, of uh, James' mother. I leave you with that uh, picture in mind. So for, but from that day, I knew that software is too important to be left only to developers and to the industry. I mean, software is the basis of our democracies, and public software has to, be a big, has to play a big part in protecting the democracy and reinforcing uh, transparency and openness, uh, not only, only to the large ecosystem, open source ecosystem out there with the industry, but also with uh, citizens, and that's uh, what we're trying to do. So my role in the administration is less about promoting free software within the administration, but more about promoting what the administration already does to the larger ecosystem and to build uh, collaboration. So that's what I'm uh, going to speak about. We have like four challenges. Uh, free software as open data, free software and public algorithm, free software um, for mutualization within the administration, and free software to uh, foster uh, the public sector attractivity. And I think that's a problem that we all have of hiring good free software developers and this is something, something we need to talk about. We have kind of the same policy that uh, uh, Alessandro was um, presenting uh, this morning uh, than in Italy about free, uh, uh, paid software by the French administration being public information by default. So part of my job is to help any agency out there to open the, the source code. And there is a lot to learn in this, uh, in this role. Uh, Etalab, which is the mission for open data uh, within the DINZIC, this, uh, the bigger administration, helps these agencies uh, try to be code in the open by uh, default. Within the DINZIC, we have two programs. One is beta.gov. Uh, this is about 70 uh, public sector startups you know, promoting IT project in an agile process, using a lot of open source and releasing uh, all the code uh, in the open by default. We have another program which is public interest entrepreneurs uh, that goes, it's teams made of data scientists, designers, developers, uh, going within the administration, spending one year there and helping this administration to transform themselves. So we spoke about transformation this morning and it's all about, uh, about that. So, uh, since public administration is relying more and more on uh, algorithm-based decision-making processes, we have 
uh, the public has to be accountable for these decisions and we have to explain this algorithm. Uh, this is a technical challenge but this is mostly a documentation challenge and how to address uh, the, the, the way the administration works is um, ahead of us. We need to uh, do more in this area. So free software uh, is a separate issue but free software is mandatory uh, as a first step to be transparent uh, on our public algorithms. And uh, Etalab is publishing a guide actually uh, on to help agencies to know whether they should explain and how they can do it. And we are going to publish shortly a paper about uh, this issue, trying to uh, build a, a dialogue with other countries on this issue. Free software has technical leverage. Uh, same as in Italy, we are in the very early stage of building a catalog of recommended free software. We had this catalog of maybe 160 free software that, is recommend, that are recommended for public agencies. And it proved to be very used, but we need to, for now it's just a PDF, so we need to make it even more useful and to be transparent about who is using what uh, to uh, foster uh, and to create opportunities of mutualization and collaboration, uh, not only on the software that we build within the administration, but also software that we use, sharing uh, good practices and use cases. We are also at the early stage of building a search engine for existing repositories published by the administration. So far, we listed all the organizations on uh, GitHub and, and GitLab that are public agencies organization, and we have about 2,000 repositories. We need to uh, make those repositories known to the whole ecosystem so that people uh, have the first idea of looking there before trying to build things themselves. And we hope this is gonna be a huge boot for mutualization in general. Then attractivity, which is uh, kind of the biggest problem we have right now. I talk about uh, BetaGoof program and the Public Interest Entrepreneurs program. So uh, we have here uh, Valentin, which is gonna speak about Open Fisca uh, this afternoon. He's a public interest uh, entrepreneur and he's lucky enough to uh, have a salary that is more uh, uh, like the salary you could expect in the uh, private sector. So we are doing efforts uh, to uh, let agencies have such developers, data scientists and designers uh, in their own administration to uh, share a culture about open source, open data and uh, do projects differently. We also published last year um, uh, the open source contribution policy of the public sector basically saying that if you are a civil servant, a developer in the administration, then you don't have to ask for permission if you want to contribute to a free software. And um, that's big because it means you can deal with your uh, service and ask them, okay, can I contribute to this software because this is key in our stack and we have to, uh, you know, do most things about security, uh, usability, accessibility, and so on. And it helps create a dialogue within the administration about existing solutions out there. This is not just about consuming. This is also about contributing and we are at the early stage of uh, uh, this. And then finally, last year we also started what we called the Blue Hats community. So Blue Hats is kind of, uh, you know, a ban about uh, the reference to the hats. And uh, Blue Hats are those people who care about free software that is used by the administration and that is also produced by the administration. So whether you are working in a ministry uh, on developing some fr uh, free software solution or whether you are in a company bringing free software services and solutions to the administration, you can wear a blue hat uh, because we think developers have to come together. It's fine, it's really nice to meet other developers here and I hope the European Commission can have more events with developers together. I'm, I'm sure Sebastian will speak about this uh, a bit more. Um, I'm gonna go quick about this. I can come back to the examples, but these are the public interest entrepreneurs uh, projects. Uh, this is one of the BetaGoof initiatives, helping an administration to create forms because that's the first step. We all always need more forms and easier to use uh, form. This is uh, the publication about public algorithms. So for now, this is just text. We need to make it more usable to create simulations and to let citizens uh, give feedback and criticism on that to make it better. This is the CHAP application. This is WhatsApp, 
but without WhatsApp, it's uh, uh, for civil servants to discuss with each other. It's free and all the countries are invited to use it and to adapt it to their needs. And this is a big project that we announced recently. This is an application by Etalab that we just published recently. And it's all about, um, and then by, it, it got a lot of exposure because the, the data that it opens are very uh, interesting to anyone. So we made the news. Uh, and, and suddenly citizens came and we have an interview on Etalab right now explaining, uh, discussing with a random citizen who helped us a lot improving this, uh, this uh, thing. But this does not happen uh, uh, by chance. You have to uh, promote this kind of collaboration to speak about this and to uh, continue. Um, I'm gonna skip this one. This is the picture. This is, these are the blue hats in December. Like in a few years, it's gonna be a lot of people. For now, this is a newsletter. We have 500 people reading it within the administration. And just a quick story. There is one guy here. This is the guy who 20 years ago I met in the tube and he gave me the line on Linux so that I could have connectivity on my computer. Without him, I wouldn't be here. And he met me 20 years after saying I was this guy. So I think this is, all about blue hats, like uh, fostering weak links between uh, developers. Um, so, as a conclusion, just uh, three words. Um, I very much enjoyed uh, Maha's uh, talk this morning about community and healthy community and how can we make sure that uh, public administration and, and healthy open source community out there work together. Also, there is a lot of challenges ahead of us. It's a bit chaotic right now, everything in the public administration and open source, we have to face it. But at Hetalab, it's also a lot of fun. I mean, it's uh, the very beginning and it's very exciting. I'm very excited uh, for to, and eager to see uh, collaboration that we are gonna have after this meeting with uh, all the people in this, uh, in this room. So free software are the children that we send to the future. I hope Europe will send more children to the future. Thank you. Thank you, Bastian. So I hope that made clear that Etala Pendensic are successfully bringing open source communities into the, open, into the government's uh, space and they're using Blue Hats as a mechanism. We're going to our next speaker, which I thought was the next, the previous speaker. Vespina has been leading the Greek open source advocacy group, GFOS, already for a decade. It started some 10 years ago when she was uh, fresh out of university where she studied media um, sorry, media and communications, and she was particularly interested in how kids embrace technology. So that took her to a, a lecture on the one child, one laptop per child project. Does anybody here remember that? Anyway, she's here 10 years later. Despina, the floor is yours. Thank you. So thank you for being here. Thank you for uh, asking me to participate in that. Uh, as uh, I uh, said, I come from Greece, from GFOS. Uh, we are an organization, okay, the full name now is Open Technologies Alliance. The first name was Greek Free Open Source Software Society. So we started primarily working with open source, but as things and the world evolved, we also evolved. So we, we were established in 2008 as a legal entity, but we were in operation as a working group since uh, before that. Uh, this is how uh, our structure, so we are uh, the members that uh, establish the organizations are uh, universities and research centers. We are a non-profit and this is just the structure, I'm gonna go through that. So our main objective is to produce and promote not only open source, but all the, the list that you have here, like open standards, open software, open content, open data, because it was very interesting that I've already heard before that it's, it's, open source is not only about software. So we have, we want to see the whole methodology beyond software. So because the, 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 the session we have here today is about coding with citizens, and I think, okay, we talked about, as I said, public administration, and we talk about how things work around public administration and how companies and how the communities work and everything. It's very challenging to engage citizens into understanding first what open source is and how the whole methodology work of open source and how open technologies work. But also because open technologies are by design human centric, 
it's, it's, it, it's easy to make it relevant. So what we do is when we preach and you know, we do a lot of policy advocacy and stuff, we also try to implement projects and start initiatives that actually showcase that what we preach about actually works. So I think uh, the use cases I'm going to present today, uh, the first one is, it has to do a lot about public administration, is a project that we call the Co Collaborative Wikification of Public Service Procedures. And we started that project a few years back. This is the problem that we were, uh, that was posed in Greece. So the public sector procedures are not fully described or documented and they, they, because of that they are broad and multiple in interpretation which led to confusion not only to public servants but actually to the citizens and business which were met with delays and uncertainty. So what we said is okay, our proposed solution is let's try and use some open, standardized, widely available tools like MediaWiki. So uh, if, you, if you saw the previous slide, we created something that looks very similar to Wikipedia. And we said, okay, let's create an infrastructure that's something that people know and it's, it's user friendly. And uh, let's do some training activities and let's crowdsource the procedure. So what was important in that project and what made it actually work is that we we gave co-ownership to the public servants. So we said, okay, we're gonna create infrastructures, we're gonna train you, we're gonna maintain all that, and we will create educational material, but the actual work, the actual record, and you know, the documentation of the public procedures will be done by the public servants. So by doing that, we gave ownership of the project actually to the public servants. So the project was not imposed to them, but it was like co-created by them. And this is why this actually worked in that case. Because from the results, we, had, we have now uh, a community of over 500 public servants that are actually working in the platform. And we have collaborated with universities. We have organized the 20 workshops, uh, more than 20 workshops actually now. And we have managed to document over 2,000 procedures, which is uh, which was a really good example of how you can take a mature uh, open source technology and make it work. So the second uh, use case I'm going to showcase is uh, how you can engage students into open source. So Google has this program that's called Google Summer of Code. I suppose some of you know about it. And this is a good example how you know other institutions can do something like that. We participate in this, pro uh, in this program in 2017 for the first time. What, uh, what they are doing actually is that they, have, they select some organizations to be mentor organizations, so we are one of the mentor organizations. Uh, by the way, this is an international program, so there are more than 200 organizations that participate into that. And they give the chance to students to work on an open source project they select for four months. So this is a good way of getting students to get involved into open source for the first time if they haven't done it before. It's very competitive. We receive a lot of application. We started in 2017 uh, with four projects and now we have 15 open source projects that we have students actively contributing for the next four months. Uh, the other uh, project I'm gonna present, okay, this is very close to my heart. <laughs> This is, uh, this is called Code and Create. So in a few years back, as you've all heard, there was a sudden influx of refugees and Europe had to deal with that. So in Greece, we had, uh, th that, that, that became an issue very quickly as well. So we dis there were a lot of funding coming for educational programs about refugees, but we decided we wanted to create something different. So we said, we're gonna have an educational program, but also, uh, looks into the social integration aspect. So what we did, we said we're going to create a, a project about mixed classes. So we have Greeks and refugees working together in a class. And uh, the whole idea is not only to get digital skills, but also uh, learn how to work together. So the setup is that we have education material in English. So everybody gets out of their comfort zone. They, they speak a different language that they know. Uh, we have the education material in, in an open learning uh, platform, Moodle. So it's, it's there, available for everyone to use, reuse, redistribute if they want to. We have set up Open Labs, which is an idea we call, we, we only use open hardware and open software in our labs. 
and uh, we have gender and cultural balance within the class and we also provide the lab uh, free for uh, students to use for exper experimentation. So this, is, this started in 2017. We had more than 350 beneficiaries. We, they do everything from basic ICT, so it's a digital skills program, to Python and uh, working with Arduino and uh, coding in the Arduino and uh, doing some more advanced web design. It, it depends on the level of, uh, of, the, of, the, of the students. But we, do, we have created these courses, as I said, they are openly uh, available as an open educational resource so anyone can reuse them. And of course, I, I know that this has been mentioned before, but uh, we do try and organize a lot of hackathons. And hackathons is a very good way of bringing different stakeholders together. So you also have like people from the public administrations that uh, say what they need, what, are, what, what, is the, what they are looking for. They usually provide us with data as well, so we can use them. And th these are just some of the hackathons that we have recently done. Uh, and then on the other hand, you have citizens, you have developers, you have researchers, we, we, we even have students, and uh, they are all trying to work together. And this is a good way of uh, getting people in the same room, learning how to collaborate, work together, and co-create solutions that can be then adapted or used by the public administration. So I think I still have one more minute. I'm almost done. Uh, as I said, you know, I think open technologies and, you know, open source is, is really important because, as I said, it's human-centric design, so it's built for us. And I think we are often, in the tech world, we are, we are a bit lost that technology should be the mean. We should, you know, use technology to go where we are and, or where we want to go. Sometimes we, we lose that sense and sometimes technology does the work for us. And this is how we, we take control back by using open source, by using open technologies. So thank you. Thanks, Espina, who showed us how challenging it can be to get the citizens to be interested in coding and uh, coding creation. Over to our last speaker, and certainly not the least, Sebastian, a computer scientist who, as a university student, got interested in how technology impacts um, society. These were the days of the, um, the data retention discussions, and he actually participated in the, the, uh, pr the protest demonstrations in Brussels and Strasbourg uh, against open source patents, false patents, software patents. So no wonder that he ended up at the European Parliament working with MEP Julia Reda on topics like this and others, and he's going to talk about one of his key projects. Sebastian. Thank you very much. It's a great privilege to be here today and uh, to be able to have worked in this, in this exciting environment of uh, open source with, uh, with Julia Reda basically in her office. Um, I used to work or I'm still working as a policy advisor in the areas mainly in uh, access to information, uh, in digitization and fundamental rights. Um, government uh, concerns us all. And uh, we have certain requirements that we have to a government. We want, to act, we want it to act transparently. We want it to be accountable for its actions. And uh, this is uh, the angle that uh, this presentation is about. <laughs> uh, you've heard all of the words, basically, that I will say today in my presentation, in the previous presentations. And I think it's a huge opportunity um, to see how it all can come together. Um, and this is about the freedoms that open source and free software grant us, uh, but also the responsibilities that it creates. It is one of the responsibilities of a government to provide us with infrastructure. And I'll say one of the responsibilities because there are lots of others um, and it is not only um, what you said before that uh, we basically take for granted that the government is there, but uh, we also are part of the, of the infrastructure that is being provided. Um, and infrastructure in that sense also includes the internet because uh, we need it for our daily communication, we need it for political participation, and we need it for businesses. 
Um, there are certain requirements that we have to any kind of infrastructure, be it trains or be it uh, the internet. It should be reliable, it needs to be safe and secure. Ah, okay, so this is step by step now. Government and administration need to be independent from service providers in, in order to be able to switch between different service providers. Only like that can we uh, enable uh, more durable and more responsible spending of public funds. Software influences decisions over our lives, so we need it to be transparent and accountable. It's basically what Bastien just said. Uh, one of the great examples of uh, one of one of the, the algorithms that do influence our lives uh, was actually in France with the Parcoursup uh, program that uh, decides basically which university a student is being accepted in. And uh, I guess all the details you will uh, learn from, from Bastien if you ask him. Um, so we need to be able not to only hold our decision makers accountable, but also software that influences decisions and that informs decisions that are being made. And free software can help government administra and administrations to be transparent and to build this transparency. The internet, as one of the infrastructures, is mainly built on free and open source software. And uh, is free and open source software is uh, used by businesses and the internet is used by businesses that are not necessarily even open source businesses, but they rely on free software to provide certain standard functionality such as encryption, for example. We call these software pieces library software uh, that uh, provide one of these standard functionalities and uh, yeah, society ultimately relies on the security and the reliability of these software. And that is why government administration have a responsibility to free software as an infrastructure. So how can we realize this res responsibility? The EU FOSSA project, that's the EU open, free and open source software audit project, is one first step to realize this responsibility. It started in 2014. Uh, it was started by uh, the three MEPs that are unfortunately not going to be around anymore in the next uh, legislative period. Um, Julia Reda, who I have been working for for the last four years, um, Max Andersson from the Swedish Greens, and uh, in the last three years, uh, Maritje Skakel from, uh, from the Netherlands. And uh, the project in 2014 was started as a reaction to severe um, uh, security vulnerabilities being found in one of the main encryption libraries, the OpenSSL library. Uh, maybe you remember the name Heartbleed, I think it was even on the main news in the evening um, because it affected really all of us. Uh, it affected uh, the internet globally and software across all our devices. So uh, what uh, we did basically in 2014 is we started this, this project to find out which um, which software is already being used by governments and in particular by uh, the EU institutions that is free software. And we want to es wanted to establish contact between the free and open source software community and the EU institutions. And uh, we did that by providing in from 2014 to uh, 15 security audits for several projects. And with the renewal of the project, we started in 2019 uh, to expand a little. What we did in 2019 as a change was we started bug bounties. Bug bounties are programs where you can uh, fi basically file a bug that you found in a software project and receive uh, a, a, a bounty in return, some money in return. Um, and uh, these were started this year. In the meantime, we have had 474 bugs that have been reported, 131 after assessment have been accepted, and 15 out of them uh, have been high or critical um, severity vulnerabilities. And that amounted up to so far 137,000 euros being paid to individuals, to hackers, to security researchers out there. And uh, I was asked to enumerate some of the software projects, but there are 15. So 
uh, one of the most um, well-known ones is the VLC project. It's the project with the little uh, cone that uh, all you know probably as a video player. And uh, they have only on Friday announced that they have actually put out the biggest security update ever thanks to the FOSSA project and thanks to the hackers that have found severe vulnerabilities or high criticality vulnerabilities in uh, their software. So uh, this is one of the examples that have made it to um, news outlets in the, in the very public. And it's a good example of something the EU can do in order to get into touch with, um, with uh, the, not only the communities, but with the public. Um, then there is PUTI. Uh, there is Apache Tomcat and uh, several other projects. Also the glibc, uh, which is a programming li library as free software that basically a lot of programs, uh, most of the, of the program stack in free software based, is based on. Uh, so 15 in total, two out of them are uh, projects that are European Commission internal and that are about to be released as open source projects. So uh, we're very much looking forward to that. Also new since uh, this year, um, we are uh, actually having three hackathons. This is the first one that happened in April uh, with uh, the PHP Symphony community. We had an additional one in May with Apache Kafka, Tomcat, Spam Assassin, Caref, Camel, PLC4X, and Singa. All of those are Apache projects. So basically all the different Apache communities came together in Brussels to meet for a weekend, to collaborate, and to improve their software. That is what these hackathons are about. And we have one more coming up at the beginning of October. But uh, what more can we do? to uh, improve software secure, free software security throughout the EU? Well, the answer is as easy and as difficult as uh, you can imagine. We need to create policy to uh, meet the responsibility that the EU institutions, that governments throughout Europe and the administrations um, have to contribute to the security of this common infrastructure. We need to give, and that is another example that has been presented several times uh, from France and from Italy today, we need to give the certainty to employees, to uh, public servants, that if they work with free software in their day jobs, that they can contribute back imp improvements that they have made to software and that they can uh, contribute their source code back to the communities uh, that they work with. We. Um, Want to so that is why, why we want to establish or why we should establish open source or source code contribution policies throughout Europe. And uh, as a second step, we need to improve the procurement rules so uh, free software can easily be uh, procured and uh, can actually benefit the public spending um, and contribute to more durable and more responsible spending. We need to allow for collaboration and sharing of software between administrations and cities and governments. And uh, we have many more FOSSA actions like the reinforcement of the open source strategy that uh, Kizanti presented in the morning. And we need to give support and legal certainty to, uh, the, um, to, the, to the governments and uh, administrations where they want to use open source software. Ultimately, what we need to do is we need to establish the FOSSA project as a permanent action item in the EU budget. Thank you very much. Thank you. We, we are looking forward to a new round, a new generation of MEPs to take over the baton. We actually have time for only one last question. And I suggest we start with Despina. Um, any tips for the European Commission on how we can bring more citizens into the open source projects of the European Commission? Can you hear me? Oh, yeah. Okay, it's working. Yeah, well, I, I wouldn't call them like tips per se, but uh, I think uh, if you, it, it depends on who you want to engage, and it's, it's really important to engage as much as many people as possible. I, I think you have to make it relevant. It has, to, it has to create a sense for them that what you're doing and what you're talking about is something that concerns them. And once they understand that this is something that it has an impact in their day-to-day -day life, 
they will for sure uh, want to contribute to that. But the, the thing that they have to be very careful, because we've seen it happening before, if you want to engage citizens and you, they do show up and they do take the time and they do contribute, you have to take under consideration what they have contributed, because otherwise you're going to lose them. If, you, if they come, they show up, they, they, they put the resources in, and then they see that uh, you haven't taken into consideration what they've said or done, and then they won't show up again. So this is learned from experience. So prepare to deliver what you're going to uh, present or promise to them. Thank you. Paco, the same question for you. Do you have recommendations on how the European Commission can involve citizens? Uh, well, it's, this is not only citizens, uh, it's also the civil society or the civic entrepreneurs. So I really like uh, what uh, you said about uh, this, uh, 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 how did, did you call the civic entrepreneurs uh, in France? Uh, but the, I, I think they are, they are essential in, uh, in the innovation part. And, uh, and I think that uh, this is something I saw also in the States. Uh, they have something similar called a startup in residence that are basically are going to be selected through an open and transparent uh, uh, process. And then they will integrate into the administration. They will work uh, for, uh, for, uh, for a salary or for, uh, for a fee uh, during a, a number of months uh, with um, the IT departments or with the users. And I think this is something we should be starting in, uh, in, uh, in the commission. And uh, I wanted to send a, a message, a more general uh, message is, uh, in this issue of, of, of collaboration, you need two for tango. And uh, I have been in this business uh, for many, many years, and the barriers are not at the level of technology or the sharing, whether it is uh, 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 software that you write on top of proprietary software or if it is open source. It's uh, the mentality, and has been commented this ceremony, of wanting to collaborate. So, most of the barriers I have found, even at European level, is, uh, and, and I really thank uh, what Estonia and Finland did together to, to drop uh, their specific versions and work on a, on, a, on a common one. I think this is essential. And for that, the secret is that uh, we need to have more and more standards over running the normal business, and we need to save there in order to get uh, the innovation path. And it's there where this collaboration and this education that everybody has mentioned as necessary for the journey. To, to take place. Excellent, that's noted. Um, thank you. Bastian, you, do you, from your experience, have some recommendations on getting citizens involved? Well, uh, I would uh, express three small ideas, uh, very practical. The first one would be to give blue hats to every hackathon out there in I Europe. I couldn't agree more. <laughs> uh, I mean, but this is, it may sound uh, superficial, but this is about you know, letting anyone uh, express that is a public servant, that is a developer for the public good, and we need to recognize and to market this. And the other idea is connected is to maybe have some kind of blue hat summer of code. We see more countries and more open source projects participating to uh, these initiatives uh, who are key to find the, the relevant people and to mentor them in the process of get, getting acquainted to what is an open source community? What is uh, the, the level of quality you are expected to um, when you are contributing to a software? So maybe this kind of initiative uh, could be partly funded and, and either by the, by the countries or by the, the, the Europe. And the last thing is um, we have this barrier of the language in Europe and we have two lingua franca, one is English for the development of a software, and the other one is the programming languages themselves. So we should put a lot of efforts into translation and documentation. This is key, like the thing we learned by running this uh, public interest uh, entrepreneurs program is that design uh, is key and documentation because the same way that we, the wiki example is really important, we need to document the processes and we need to document the softwares and how they are part of these processes. So um, I would love to see a blue hat summer of documentation <laughs> or something like that. I'm not just marketing my, my thing. It's just, uh, there is a nice global movement about writethedocs.org and we are running the next, uh, the first Write the Docs event in France in a few days, and I hope we can connect more Write the Docs 
uh, events around software because that's a very easy way to connect with people who are not developers and would just want to contribute. Thank you, Bastian. Sebastian. The just like question that, no question? You. The same question. <laughs> How do we get citizens more involved into European Commission open source software projects? Do more hackathons, that's a good one, yes. <laughs> I think that the, that the FOSSA project is actually already a first step to reach out more to, to the general public. And uh, we've seen what, what great response it has created in, in, in the public. Um, so I would just really say let's, let's continue this path. And uh, I really appreciate that uh, Crisanti said that there would be a uh, open source competence center. I think that can be a, a very good step towards that. Uh, to also establish some of the of the uh, FOSA actions, and as well um, other projects such as the um, cybersecurity center that is currently in the making, um, it could uh, well go into that direction. But if I may, um, the one thing that really is a, is an issue at heart, um, we need to not only engage uh, people in general, but we need to make sure that uh, representation is also a given, and um, uh, representation does matter. It's uh, not only good for society, it's good for businesses. If I can recommend a piece of reading, Brotopia by em Emily Chang, um, as she displays uh, brilliantly um, how representation in um, technology firms can make a difference, in particular when it comes um, to uh, yeah, problems that might occur later. Thank you for that. That's a very good suggestion. Thanks to all the four speakers here. Let's give them a nice warm-up or a round of applause. Thanks.